Okay, we are now live on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Matt Brown, Communications Specialist for Sonoma County, and this is our COVID-19 update for Wednesday, August 10th. Let's begin with a brief message from Sylvia Limos from our communications team for our Spanish-speaking viewers. Sylvia? Buenas tardes, soy Silvia Lemos del Condado de Sonoma. Esta es la actualización sobre el coronavirus y las directrices en las escuelas para los expertos que van a regresar esta semana. Esta actualización se está transmitiendo en vivo por nuestro canal de YouTube con interpretación al español. Para escuchar la versión en español, puede usar el link de YouTube que se encuentra en la publicación de esta reunión en la página de Facebook del Condado de Sonoma. Muchas gracias, Matt. Thank you, Silvia. For many of us, especially parents with school-aged children, the summer was too short. A lot of students are headed back to school this week and next week, and unfortunately, this will be the third straight school year that will begin in the COVID-19 pandemic. The good news is that we have seen a decline in the case rate for the county over the past two weeks, and the current variant of the virus is not causing severe illness as in past surges. And we have learned many lessons over the past few years to keep, keep classrooms safe and students in desks. This is also the first school year that we have a vaccine available for everyone six months and older, so we can protect all students as they return to classes. Still, we know that parents have many questions about the health of their children as they send them back to school. So today's webinar will focus on returning to school safely. We are joined by Dr. Sundari Mace, Sonoma County's health officer, as well as Dr. Steve Harrington, Sonoma County School Superintendent. After the presentations, we will take your questions. If you have a question and would like to share it, please just put it in the comments area of the Facebook or YouTube page where you are watching and we will see it. You are also welcome to email your questions to publicaffairs at sonoma-county.org. That's publicaffairs, one word, at sonoma-county.org. Let's start with Dr. Dr. Mace, who has an update on where we are currently in the pandemic and the latest health guidance. Dr. Mace? Great, thank you so much, Matt. First, let me start by saying that we're still seeing widespread transmission occurring in our community. But unlike surges we've seen in the past, as Matt just said, I am less concerned about this current wave for the reasons that we just are not seeing the very negative outcomes of uh, increased hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, let me pull up my slides to share. Are you able to see those slides, Matt? Yes, we are. Okay, let me put it in presentation mode just a second. There we go. Okay, great. So um, as you can see here, uh, these are our latest uh, metrics, the country, uh, the countywide metrics that is, as of August 10th, 2022 today, we have 25.4 new cases per 100,000 residents per day and 14.1% overall test positivity with 18.6% test positivity in our lowest HPI quartile. So the new cases per 100,000 residents per day have been decreasing uh, steadily here over the past couple of weeks. Um, we obviously peaked during Omicron, but then again had a, another surge and seem uh, trend-wise that we're on our way down. Overall test positivity has remained high, somewhere uh, between 14 to 18% uh, for the past several months. And uh, I think we will continue to see that as this time because we do have widespread transmission in our community. Hospitalizations, however, have remained pretty stable over the past couple of months. We've had currently 40 people hospitalized with COVID, and we've had somewhere between 40 to 55 people in the hospital uh, over the past couple of months. And of those people, about half of them are there with COVID, not admitted for COVID. What that means is they, they may have been in the hospital for another reason and tested positive for COVID. 79 people have died from COVID since January 1st, 2022. We uh, are doing quite well in Sonoma County in comparison with other counties in the state. We do have the ninth highest vaccination rate in the state. 
we've had 20% fewer cases per 100,000 population than uh, California overall, and 57% fewer deaths per 100,000 than California overall. And this probably speaks to the fact that we've had pretty high vaccination percentages uh, in, uh, in really all of our age groups, but especially in our most vulnerable populations. Uh, this is a slide that just shows uh, what has happened over the course of the pandemic. And you can see here, we initially had our uh, surge and then vaccination was available and many, many people got vaccinated and our cases, hospitalizations and deaths decreased. Then we had, of course, the Delta surge, even though 80% of residents uh, 12 plus were partially vaccinated at this point, we still saw a surge in case rates, hospitalizations and deaths. Then, of course, we had our Omicron surge, which led to very, very high case rates. However, as you can see, hospitalizations were not mirrored um, uh, the same as case rates. Rather, they're much lower. And although we did see a blip in deaths, we didn't see, um, uh, again, a huge surge in deaths, suggesting that Omicron, although more transmissible from person to person, just didn't carry the same virulence and wasn't as uh, deadly and of course, our population was quite vaccinated at the point when we saw the Omicron surge. And here we are now uh, somewhere um, with a high case, overall case rate, but not as high hospitalizations and definitely not seeing deaths. We've done, as I've already said, very well with our overall vaccine administration. Uh, you can see here that 84% of the total population is at least partially vaccinated, 78% fully and 6% partially. And if you take a look at different age groups, we've done quite well and still have some work to do in our younger age groups. That would be the five to 11 year old population. And of course, our, our uh, the baby, six months to four to five year old, which just got approved uh, recently. And in terms of race, ethnicity, we're also doing well, but there's still disparities that are seen. Um, and you can see that uh, the Latinx population, Asian non-Hispanic, and uh, Black African-American populations are the ones that have the lower uh, vaccination rates. Let me stop sharing there. And, um, um, you know, we're, even though we're seeing a lot of transmission, as I said, we have widespread transmission of COVID in the community, we are not considering a return to health orders or restrictions at this point. I will continue to monitor the situation and act accordingly. As school resumes, we will be operating under the latest California Department of Public Health guidelines for safe schools. This includes a strong recommendation to continue wearing masks in indoor public settings with large groups of people gathered close together, including classrooms. High quality surgical KN95 or N95 masks are still strongly recommended. I also strongly recommend that all students get vaccinated against COVID-19 and remain up to date for protection against the virus to reduce transmission. Additionally, we know that children have fallen behind, as I just stated, on receiving um, the uh, vaccines, that is the younger age groups, and they've also fallen behind in receiving other vaccines over the course of the pandemic, placing them and community at increased risk of falling ill from other vaccine-preventable illnesses. So I do encourage parents to make sure that children stay up to date on all the other required vaccinations. For example, polio, measles, hepatitis B, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus. Uh, there's a whole list of vaccines that your pediatrician can help you with and make sure that your child has received. Testing still remains a key mitigation layer to detect and curb transmission of COVID-19. Schools are encouraged to ensure access to COVID-19 testing for students and staff, particularly for vulnerable communities. We recommend that antigen tests be considered the primary option for detecting COVID-19 in schools compared to PCR tests. Due to the increased travel and social interactions that often occur during school breaks, it's recommended that students and staff get tested for COVID-19 prior to returning to school following major breaks. Anyone who tests positive for COVID-19 should stay home from school for at least five days. If there are no symptoms and there's a negative test on day five, then the student can end isolation. Quarantine is no longer required for close contacts of a positive individual, but a close contact should test 
within three to five days of a positive exposure and wear a mask for a total of 10 days. Though the evidence continues to evolve, we've had two years of data and experience regarding how to prevent transmission of COVID-19 in schools. We've learned from examples of what works and what doesn't work. Core mitigation strategies are necessary for safe and successful schooling. If those mitigation strategies are implemented as several layers of safety, schools can be safe learning environments for children and safe workplaces for teachers and staff. Let me add uh, that uh, we, again, I highly recommend wearing masks in the indoor setting. Um, and if there are cases detected and if there is an outbreak situation, then uh, masking uh, definitely should happen in the indoor setting. Um, I will turn this back over to you, Matt, now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mace. I'd now like to turn to Dr. Steve Harrington, Sonoma County School Superintendent, for a message from the Office of Education. Dr. Harrington? Thank you, Matt. Uh, I'd like to go through our slides as it relates to going back to school, because we realize that it's important that our students come back to a safe learning environment. What's different for 22-23? First and foremost, schools will remain open. We know uh, in the Budget Act last year that there will not be a distance learning option. That was repeated in this year's Budget Act, that there will not be a distance learning option. School will be the primary presenter and of instruction. So first of all, that's what our mission is to start this school year. Well, the reason for that is we have more tools to manage the illness. We have masks, which have been distributed to every school site from the federal government. We have tests, which have been distributed to every school site uh, this year. And with the recommendation that we'll be going, I'll be going over later in this slideshow. And we have improved vaccines. And as, as Dr. Mace has said, we've expanded the option for younger children six months and older. So now we have some preventatives. We also have a, a, a preventative a vaccine or medication, should you be a, a test positive, that we recommend the five-day continuation of medicines that are provided to you by the pharmacist. So we now have some intervention steps that we can use. Next slide. Antigen test distribution, as I said, screen before you should your, send your child back to school. About 50% of the students will return to school this week. The other 50% will come next week. Primarily the secondary schools are opening or the unified school districts are opening this week and the smaller elementary districts are primarily opening next week. But every school district was given and every private school was given and every charter school was given a COVID testing kit. This type of kit offers a quick result within 15 minutes. Each student or staff member should use the test to screen before they attend school on the first day of school. There is a second test in that kit, and that should be used when a student or staff member exhibits the symptoms of COVID so they can see or determine whether they should return to school the following day. In 2022-23, the California Department of Public Health has provided us with vaccines, which are recommended but not required for students, but we highly recommend it, especially those students who are participating in sports. The reason for that is they have to test weekly. That has not gone away, so they will have to test weekly before they, a sports activity. And should they be having a high exposure rate with the team, then the game or the event may have to be canceled. So we would re really recommend that the team stay safe and that everyone be vaccinated. Um, we are strongly recommend masking. We also know that should three or more students appear active in a classroom with COVID, the class will more, more than likely observe masking for the 10 day requirement because everyone's been exposed. The teacher automatically because of Cal OSHA will be required to wear the mask. Schools may want to consider holding certain events outdoors. What we're talking about here is, we know that in the opening of school, there's usually back to school events for parents and students. These law, large congregate settings uh, should be held outside as much as possible. 
Um, holding them inside in a warm gym or facility may not be the most ideal situation. So we're strongly encouraging schools to look at that. We're also strongly encouraging schools to stagger the presentation so that you don't have all the parents there at one time. These are all decisions that will be made at the local level, what best fits their environment. Testing for school workers. School workers are required, if they're not vaccinated, to be tested weekly. And that is what is required. That's a, they need to have at least the two shot series or the JJ vaccine one shot series. And they have to have proof of that. Parent volunteers come under the same Cal OSHA rules. If you're going to work in a classroom, volunteer in a classroom, you need to show proof of vaccination. If you are not vaccinated, you will have to show proof of testing. So those are things that are required for the school. The district, and there are 40 school districts in Sonoma County, may choose a stricter requirement uh, for volunteers or for the gathering of parents on campus. Because once again, one parent can always see the reality of that, but when you have multiple parents gathering at the school classroom door to pick up their children, you have a congregate setting. This is what we're talking about. So districts may restrict how students are picked up or released because of that. And remember, every school must have a COVID safety plan. I advise all parents to read the school's COVID safety plan, which should be posted on the district's website. Um, school boards are currently reviewing those plans. And if there are gonna be modifications or changes, they'll probably do those at a public board meeting for parent information. Next slide. In case of a positive test or exposure, students for students. If students test positive for COVID, they should stay home. Families whose students were on campus during the infectious period should notify the school. In fact, parents are strongly, you have a duty to report. Students who do not have symptoms and test negative on day five can end isolation and return to school, but they must wear a mask around all others for five more days. If unable to test, students can end isolation after day 10, where they are wearing a mask for those 10 days. And they must be fever free uh, for 24 hours. That's a standard school rule, regardless of COVID. All who test positive should mask around others for 10 days. Students who are in close contact to someone with COVID, those students or individuals who are exposed to COVID should test within three to five days, as Dr. May said, and, la and the last exposure and should wear a well-fitting mask around all others. Masks were distributed to every school. Masks are available for parents should they need them for their children, uh, but they don't have to stay home if they continue to test negative. They can still, still come to school. They just will have to wear their mask until their period is over. The other thing that we talked about or Dr. Mace and I have talked about is the required vaccines. We realized that many families were unable to keep their pediatric appointments during the last two or three years because of the isolation period. During the pandemic, children around the world fell behind. It's just not here in Sonoma County. In fact, California, one in eight children are behind in their shots. And so it's important that we get them caught up because what we don't want happening, and I think Dr. Mace has made this clear, we don't need to have COVID as one outbreak and chickenpox as another outbreak or measles or whooping cough. Those things need to be protected because what you do is you compound the situation even more severely. Now we have a new grade level opening this year for, and the districts have till 2025 to implement the new grade level, but some of our districts are starting it this year. TK, those are four-year-olds, may start school and they will start in TK. And then when they're five, they will go to kindergarten. But what you need to know is that all the shots for TK are required. I mean, all the shots for kindergarten are also required for TK. What, do, what are those shots? They are the, D, the DTaP shots, which is diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, polio, which is a four-shot situation, hepatitis B, which is a three-shot rotation, measles, mumps, and rubella, MMR, which is a two-shot rotation, and chickenpox, which is a two-shot rotation. Now, no one's taking all these shots in any one day. The idea is you need to start the shots 
so that you could be admitted to school. So you have to be in a uh, under doctor's care for the shots and you may start the first day of school. Should you enroll your child on the first day of school and have no proof of any of the shots started, the child must be excluded. He or she could lose their place in the class assignment. So that's a very important to parents to start the series, go today, make an appointment and start this test shot series. Now, when you change schools, oftentimes you'll have to show your, your shot record. When you enter the seventh grade, there's another round of shots that have to be taken. There's the booster for tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. And then there's a chicken pot booster for seventh graders. Those shots must be taken entering the seventh grade. So if you haven't started or scheduled those shots, you will know, need to show proof of those shots. Now, in the seventh grade, if you've got the first series of shots started, you can still enter school, but you need to show that you have, are going to be getting your shots. So that's important for parents to know. The state of California is making a very concerted effort to get students caught up on their shots. Once again, I need to let people know that in 2016, the law changed. There are no longer personal belief exemptions for any of the required vaccinations. Those are the tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, chickenpox, polio shots. Those are the required shots. At this time, COVID is not a required shot. It is anticipated that we'll be made a requirement in 2023, but we haven't gotten the rules on that yet. But I really and strongly encourage parents to be ahead of the game and get their children vaccinated. And I guess we'll take questions now, Matt. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Harrington. Uh, now we are going to take questions from you, the public, as well as from the media. And I'm joined by Eric Whitmer's house, the Director of Communications for the Sonoma County of, uh, Office of Education. If you have a question and would like to share it, please just put it in the comments area of Facebook or the YouTube page where you are watching it, and we will see it. You are also welcome to email your questions to publicaffairs at Sonoma County, sonoma-county.org. That's public affairs, one word, at sonoma-county.org. And if you're a member of the media and on the Zoom call, you can just raise your hand in the Zoom in the uh, uh, chat function of the Zoom. So let's start with the first question. Uh, this is probably a good question for Dr. Mace. Uh, Dr. Mace, you mentioned that there's uh, a, still many school-aged children that haven't been vaccinated for COVID-19. Uh, so there's plenty of parents out there who who still could get their children vaccinated and want to know where they can get it. Um, will there still be school-based? Uh, vaccine clinics this year? And if not, where else could uh, someone get their children vaccinated for COVID-19? Yeah, thanks, Matt. As you know, last year, the Sonoma County Office of Education did host many, many school clinics. There are not going to be school-based clinics for vaccination at this time, uh, except for staff. So we highly recommend that you take your child to their pediatrician for this vaccine, the COVID vaccine, as well as all other vaccinations if they require other vaccinations. Uh, there are also, um, there's a fixed site for vaccination in Roseland that's still available. And we do have a mobile van that does provide vaccines at different locations as well. So there are numerous different opportunities for vaccination in the county. And I highly recommend that anybody, any parent whose kids have not been fully up to date on vaccines, get that vaccination series over with, as well as all of the other vaccines. Um, the next question, uh, question for Dr. Harrington to take, is there a remote learning option available if I don't feel comfortable sending my child to school? There is no remote learning option available for school children last year or this year. There is an independent study option uh, but a child needs to be out of school for greater than 10 days for that option. But the state has this year provided some flexibility for independent study for less than 10 days. Two different options for independent study, but um, they, that the parent would have to make a choice uh, as it relates to that. When, the, when we had um, distance learning, we had so much synchronous instructional time that's not a requirement anymore. So independent study could be study packets. It could be a variety of work depending on what the school district provides. 
Great. Um, here's another question that we've uh, received a few times, Dr. Mace. Um, they're asking, why are we not having a uh, mask mandate in schools? Why is, is it just a strong recommendation? Why not uh, make it a full mandate for masking in schools? Thanks, Matt. Thanks for that question. Um, well, you know, at this time, we are seeing high rates of COVID, but as I pointed out in my presentation, we're really not seeing the negative outcomes. The reasons that we had mask mandates in the previous two years is because we had not only high case rates, but we were seeing increase in hospitalizations and deaths. And we were concerned about hospital capacity. And um, as everybody knows, I mean, for the past two years, those were the indicators that we were using for why we really wanted to try to tamp down on transmission. Now we are really not seeing increases in hospitalizations and deaths. However, it's still a very high recommendation to wear a mask in any indoor public setting if you wanna protect yourself. Because obviously if you get COVID, as you can see, people are gonna be out of work, out of school. It's definitely gonna have an impact on the community. So there's a very high recommendation. I recommend that you wear a mask in indoor settings and re would recommend that our students do the same. Uh, to try to prevent further transmission of COVID in schools, which are kind of like a congregate setting with lots of people together in one place. Um, Dr. Mace, one question that we have received a few times is whether there is an outbreak scenario that would lead to close, uh, cause a school to close and potentially move to remote learning, um, or if there's any sort of case threshold that would trigger a, a one-day closure for a school. Yeah, you know, at this, at this time, as uh, Dr. Harrington mentioned as well, there is no plan for us to close schools. We realize the importance of keeping our students in school and keeping our schools open. And again, because we're not um, as as worried about the high you know, high numbers of hospitalizations or deaths, uh, we feel that we've done really well protecting our vulnerable populations through vaccination and our outreach. Um, and education efforts are non-pharmaceutical measures that we've used. Um, I don't see in the near future going to a time when we'll again be closing schools and going to remote uh, learning. Having said that, we in the Department of, of Health Services and Public Health are constantly looking at the trends in the data. We are seeing where we're going, we're looking at variants, seeing what the impact of variants is, and if potentially, there is a worse variant that comes our way, then we certainly have the uh, ability to revisit these kinds of um, actions. But for right now, I'm not seeing it happen. Let me add on to that a little bit. <clears throat> Last year, during the Omicron uh, surge, we did have a school or two close, not because of the student exposure, it's the fact that we couldn't get enough qualified substitutes to cover the classrooms. And when a district doesn't have enough qualified instructors, they have to make an alternative solution or resolution. They could move kids between classes and double up. But this particular situation, they took one of their staff development days and closed school on a Friday so they could recoup for uh, the following Monday. So the situation is every school remained open unless they didn't have enough qualified teachers, not so much as it related to the students but having qualified substitutes. Great, thanks for that, uh, both of you. Um, let's go to our media, one of our media partners right now. I see uh, Martin Espinoza of the Press Democrat has a question. Uh, Martin, uh, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? We can, thank you. Great. Um, hi, Dr. Harrington. Earlier this week, um, we, we, he, the uh, SCO, put out a uh, press release uh, raising concerns about the possibility of seeing the same kind of decline in childhood vaccination rates here in the county that we're seeing across the planet. Um, the public health data that was shared with me this afternoon shows that that didn't happen, that we stayed steady. Uh, currently, I think at about 92.6% of kindergartners uh, last year uh, did get their, uh, their uh, immunizations. And uh, I was hoping that you could comment on that, uh, given the concern that you guys expressed earlier this week, and maybe even Dr. Mace. Uh, is that good news? Uh, I'll go first, uh, Dr. Mace. First of all, when you look at the results as a countywide average, it is good news. 
But when you look at it at a geographical, you will find that we have some districts well below 90%. That is a high risk situation in those schools. And so we will take those schools with the high risk situation and COVID, that is what our concern is. We have 40 school districts, many of them are small. So the percentages often show higher because of a small enrollment. But you need to know that that's a concern to us. Uh, those student schools that have those lower numbers are on the west side of our county. Dr. Mason and I have talked about that and an effort is con being concerted to uh, provide as much information to the public about getting vaccines. But Dr. Mace has the epidemiology on that, and so I'll let her speak to that. Yeah, thanks so much for the question, Martin, and thank you, Dr. Harrington, um, for that. I agree 100% with Dr. Harrington that we have work to do in this area. And I, uh, looking at it purely from public health perspective, even 92% is low. When you have vaccine-preventable diseases that uh, there, it's just sort of a no-brainer that we need to get the vaccines in kids so that we don't have outbreaks. Over the course of the last 15, 20 years, we've seen pertussis outbreaks amongst the unvaccinated population, uh, really all over the U.S. Uh, recently, we've seen an increase in polio, of all things, that we felt, you know, had been eradicated. We also um, have, you know, the uh, varicella you know, or chicken pox uh, that we've seen now all, and hepatitis B, of course, for which there is really no cure if you get it. So these are really, really important preventable communicable diseases. And I just want uh, all parents to uh, really think about talking to your pediatrician if your child is not yet vaccinated, get the facts and get them vaccinated. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mace, I have another question, which um, is on a little bit of a different topic, but it's a topic that you've been addressing in other places lately. And that is, what is the current level of risk for monkeypox in schools? Yeah, thanks for that question, Eric, because it's a really, really important topic that we intend to discuss more with our community. Right now, I believe we have only 22 cases of monkeypox. And I say only because there are some surrounding Barry counties that have many, many more cases. And we're really seeing monkeypox in a specific subpopulation of people who are at risk. We are seeing monkeypox mainly in individuals that have had more intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact, and specifically in men, men who have sex with men. And that's the population that we are really uh, interested in targeting to make sure that we prevent monkeypox. Um, so we are giving pre-exposure and post-exposure vaccines targeted to this very high-risk population. So having said that, everybody knows to, needs to know what the signs and symptoms of monkeypox are. Uh, every single case that's occurred has a characteristic rash, but you can also get fever, headache, um, uh, sort of general mal malaise, um, but you have to have come in contact, very close, intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact with someone who actually has a rash to be at risk for getting monkeypox. So therefore, I would say, I would like parents and students to be aware of what monkeypox is and to know how it's spread. Uh, but I don't think at this point, it's a big risk for the population of, that we're talking about, which is parents, uh, that is students who are in school at this point. And um, you know, I would invite Dr. Kaplan, Gabriel Kaplan, or Public Health Division Director, to jump in if there's anything else you'd like to add on this topic. Um, thanks, Dr. Mace, but I, I would just echo what you said. There's very limited instances of transmission from an infected adult. Um, most of the cases are with adults. Uh, most of the cases that we know about are related to uh, intimate activities. Uh, so I think there's very low risk uh, in sending your child to school uh, related to this particular virus. Great, thank you both for that. Um, let's go back to uh, COVID. Uh, here's another question, probably for you, Dr. Mace. What are you doing to ensure that schools in the least advantaged communities have the resources to keep students safe? Yeah, thank you so much again for that question. Um, as you know, um, over the past two years, we've really focused on um, making sure that we provide services 
for the hardest hit, com hit communities. And we've known that um, it has been the lower uh, HPI quartiles, HPI one and two, and schools in those areas that really had been more hit hard with COVID. So we've reached out, provided um, outreach and education, testing um, services, vaccination opportunities for communities of color and other vulnerable communities. We continue in the Department of Health Services and Public Health to focus our efforts on those uh, people who don't have the other resources potentially um, for testing, for example, we are providing um, the antigen test kits uh, to the hardest hit, hit communities through our community-based organizations. Uh, we, as Dr. Harrington just noted, every student has received from the state a, a, set, a set of two tests, one for testing prior to going to school initially, and then another test in case you're a contact or you're symptomatic. And we'll continue to provide those res resources for schools uh, that are falling in those areas that have been hardest hit by COVID. And uh, again, you know, our resources are less now as you as we put out and, and discussed many times. So we're not gonna be able to potentially provide the same amount of services that we did over the past uh, two and a half years. However, that is our goal is to focus on those communities. And I would just like to add, Dr. Mace, that the public needs to be aware that we had an auxiliary funding from the federal government to run shot clinics, to run outreach to communities that were underrepresented. So those funds uh, expired last year, the fiscal year, 20 July, June 30th, 2022. And most of the funds will be expired by June of 2023. So both of our departments have downsized as those federal funds have diminished. So that's why we're strongly encouraging most of the support now goes to the medical providers as they provide the shots to the community. Uh, next, we have a question um, that I think you can probably take Dr. Harrington and that is um, in, in regard to, you know, the number of people circulating on campus. Uh, question comes in that says some schools are open campus and some schools are not. Who makes that decision and why does it differ across our school campuses in Sonoma County? Well, each school board, based on their own, before COVID, each school board has rules as it relates to open or closed campuses. They choose, the, they get to choose those rules or make those rules in accordance with their school safety plans. Now, we have COVID and that's another dimension and districts may have changed some of those rules to add more restrictions, to restrict parents' access, to restrict uh, walking on campus access, because we, once again, we still have to do contact tracing. So knowing who's on your campus is Im imperative to school for both safety plan purposes and for COVID uh, contact tracing. So that's why there are restrictions, probably more so than we had a few years ago. But uh, that's one of the reasons access on campuses is determined by the local school board in relationship to its school safety plan and in relationship to its COVID safety plan. Uh, let's go back to Martin. Uh, did you have a follow-up question, Martin? Yes, I did. I wanted to go back to the immunization um, question. And Dr. Harrington, you raised the, the issue of certain uh, districts in the West County having um, significantly lower immunization rates than uh, than the county overall. Um, do we know if, or maybe this should be for Dr. Mace, do we know, it, have you taken a look at, at the, these uh, districts in the West County and whether or not those rates have declined or stayed steady in the past two years? Yeah, we're, we're uh, looking at that data, Martin, and uh, we're trying to, you know, get a little bit more granular and looking at it, but it's something that our epidemiology team is working on. Okay. And I would just add, Martin, that having been in this position for 12 years, the West Side has always been a little bit below the county's average. Um, ideally, our county used to be, when I started in 20, 20, 20, 2004, um, uh, 2004, we had about 95% countywide average. We're now in the 90s. We've dropped. Um, but I will tell you 
that uh, the districts on the west side have also dropped even more than they were before. So we have a, we now know we have a strategic information plan that we have to pursue, Dr. Mason and myself, with those districts on the west side to get their immunization records up. So, so essentially we, we weathered, well, we still don't know what granularly what's happening in the West County, but overall we weathered the pandemic, keeping our, our, our rates from declining further but we still have a lot of work to do be, uh, compared to what, where we were back in 2004? Oh yes, I think so. Uh, I would let you know that when you look at the report that has it by district, you'll probably see where those districts are. Now you have to look at those districts as it looks at some of them could have an online school, which may overstate the problem, mm -hmm. but you need to look at the districts demographically and geographically. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a question on um, extracurricular activities. It, you may have touched on it, but let's um, uh, reiterate. Are there any additional requirements or guidelines for participants and spectators of school sports or other extracurricular activities? Dr. Mace, do you want to go first? Yeah, I, I'll go first and then you can follow. Um, at this time, there are no mandates or requirements for school sports, extracurricular activities. However, it's still a high recommendation for indoor activities or sports that um, students mask during these activities. As we know that the likelihood of transmission of COVID is higher in the indoor setting. In addition, it's a high recommendation that athletes test uh, prior to events, like um, you know, comp competitive events. Um, we had been recommending that all along. And I think it was pretty successful in limiting transmission to test before. And I think Dr. Harrington might be able to give a few more specifics. Well, and I, I will give you a little, you know, we really need the community's participation. Uh, many of our teachers work all day and then they have a supervision responsibilities at games and events. One of those supervision responsibilities requires that they remind parents to either wear a mask if there are restrictions and the school may have imposed a restriction because they had an outbreak. And parents don't need to be argumentative about it. These people are doing their job the best they can. And it's really imperative that we try to cooperate with the school site supervisors if they do have a restriction at that school site. Now, right now, we're doing most of our events outside, so it's not that uh, situation, and there's air, and there's more circulation. But it's the inside events that cause some problems. And last year, because of an outbreak with Omicron, we had to reduce the activity level and the access level of sporting events. That's always at the call of the county health director based on the numbers. And based on the numbers, uh, we needed to do that. And I support that decision she made last year because it was the safest decision for students. Now, it wasn't necessarily the most popular decision because I'm, I was a parent of a sports participant. It's never popular. You want to see your kid play, but we have to look at reality here. The reality is we want to keep our schools safe. And that's what we did. For 30 days, we restricted play indoors, um, and we got through the Omicron virus. So I just want to let everyone know, we all follow the rules and we follow staff guidelines. There's less likelihood of us losing uh, the flexibility that we are currently enjoying. Here's a question. Uh, it's it's more of a an, an ask. They're saying, can we please have a school mask man requirement for at least the first month uh, to help limit uh, COVID spread when people return uh, to indoor school? That that sort of begs the question: Is there any more inherent risk after a big break like summer break or or winter break or fall um, uh, spring break when people are coming back from? Uh, congregate settings or from uh, vacations? And is there anything that people should be doing, if not a mask mandate, if there's anything that people and students should be doing um, when they first return, like from summer break? Well, I think uh, te the test kit should be used because you're right, you know, uh, during breaks, uh, the thought is probably that, you know, kids are with parents, extended family, maybe traveled, maybe got had some, went to some family gatherings or gathering of friends. Um, and again, vacation. 
So definitely that's the reason why the state is giving antigen tests to each student to test prior to going to school. And that's very important. Um, and then of course, um, I think the question was, why are we not having a mask mandate? Well, again, you know, we, as I said before, uh, we use the mask mandates primarily when we were really trying to prevent the worst outcomes of COVID. Um, when we were seeing the deaths in our seniors that are vulnerable in the skilled nursing facilities, seeing our hospitals fill up with patients sick with COVID in our ICU beds and potentially even ventilator shortages. And we're just not seeing that right now. So I think we're really, my, my message to parents who are concerned is ensure that your kids are wearing a mask and ensure that they are uh, protecting themselves by being vaccinated, uh, by uh, you know following all the other guidance that we're giving. Um, and um, it is, there is an element now of sort of personal and uh, responsibility to make sure that you keep yourself, your family and your community safe. And that's why I have a high recommendation for indoor masking in all public settings. But nothing prohibits a parent from ask, telling their student, their child to wear a mask. So uh, I know that there's concern that other children aren't wearing a mask, but as a parent, you have some parent responsibilities. And if you feel concerned enough about it, then have your child wear a mask. Because that's going to be common. There will be many children wearing masks. And so it's they're not out of place. That's um, great. Oh, go ahead, Eric. Dr. Harrington, I was going to uh, ask you uh, a question. We, we received a question from uh, someone who is concerned about uh, some of the air treatment devices in use in schools that use UV lights. And they want to know are, whether those devices are certified for use in schools in California. Well, most of those devices were bought with federal uh, environmental, uh, federal dollars for COVID. They had to meet a criterion requirement. The, the feds and the state gave specifications that had to meet classroom standards. So I, I don't know the particular device in question. But the ones that were purchased by our schools were most met the federal and state requirements. And by our schools, I mean SCO schools. Each district has to be accountable for its own purchases. Um, here's a question, Dr. Mace. It's probably a simple answer, but um, they want to know. Is the county doing or will be doing anything different from uh, the California Department of Public Health? Not at this time. We um, don't have any of our own local orders other than our local uh, um, state of emergency at this time. So we are uh, pretty much completely aligned with the state. And as you know, the state does have a few orders that are still um, uh, effective or in effect that would be the uh, orders for the high risk settings, like healthcare workers, uh, the residential care facilities for the elderly, homeless shelters, things like that. Um, so we don't see deviating from uh, the state at this time. And I would only add is that CDPH did give, give the county uh, its own authority. It gave every county its own authority should it feel or deem it necessary. So. Um, our numbers don't indicate that we need any additional requirements right now, but uh, nothing prohibits us in collaboration with the county should we have a case outbreak. Yeah, and that's what, as I said, we're monitoring where we're going. We're monitoring our numbers, uh, looking at the most important um, indicators, the hospitalizations and deaths, and we are monitoring variants. Great. Uh, I appreciate that discussion, both of you. That's That's been very helpful. Let me just look to our media partners uh, on the line real quick to see if there's any other questions uh, from the media. Seeing none, uh, we're going to go ahead and end our session there then. I really want to thank all of our panelists for joining today. I would also like to thank the crew who helped put this together, including Julie, our Spanish interpreter, and Odie, our ASL interpreter. Let me remind you that this webinar will be repeated tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. in Spanish. We encourage you all to go to socoemergency.org slash vaccine for more information. That's socoemergency.org slash vaccine for more information. And have a great week and stay safe, everybody. <laughs>